Hyatt's Dwyer, richarddwyer.com, right? Look us up, too, on our blog, keepingitfree.blogspot.com. Let's talk about a famous crime. It was one I was raised with, right? I was told about this crime growing up in New York City in the 1970s, right? It's the murder of Roseanne Quinn. You might have heard about this case. This is the crime upon which the book, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, was written, right? This is the crime upon which the movie, which was released in 1977 with Diane Keaton, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, was based. Right? You have a school teacher who is murdered in her apartment, right? After picking up a guy at a singles bar. Right? The moral of this story, as it was told to me in the 1970s, was that this teacher should have been married shouldn't have been out meeting strange men, right? Should have been living more of a traditional life. And that it was because she had issues with her self-esteem, right? Because as a child, she had had polio, which had left her with a limp, right? It's because she supposedly had issues with her self-esteem, that she was actually an unmarried, sexually active young woman meeting men beneath her social station in life, right? Had she just been more traditional, had she found Mr. Wright or tried to find Mr. Wright, had she been home instead of out on the day after New Year's Eve, right? This is New Year's Day. It's a Monday night in New York City, right? Keep in mind, she's a school teacher. There's work. There's a job she has to go to, right? Here she is going out during the week. If she had just lived the life that older generations had lived, she wouldn't have been in a position to have been brutally murdered by a stranger. What was she doing having a stranger in her apartment? Right? And of course, let's talk about the stranger. Right? You can imagine how scandalous this was to traditionalists. The stranger who killed her, a gentleman named John Wayne Wilson, was bisexual. Right? He was married to a woman. He was living with a guy, according to some reports, he's supposed to have been a hustler, right? How could you possibly socialize with bisexuals, right? How could you have taken a gay man home? Understand, the homosexuality was part of the moral tale here, because supposedly, according to the story, <clears throat> John Wayne Wilson couldn't, and this is graphic, John Wayne Wilson couldn't perform. He couldn't get an erection. This is what he told the cops, right? And, of course, the victim then started mocking him, according to reports, right? According to his version of events. The argument is that he would have gotten an erection, of course, if he were straight, not bisexual. Of course, he couldn't get an erection. She mocked him. How dare her? <clears throat> right? This is the cautionary tale. And then, of course, feeling challenged, being mocked. Isn't this really blaming the victim? He then lashes out. Right? Stabs her 18 times. <clears throat> Sticks a broom between her legs. Right then, sanitizes the crime scene, wipes his prints from all over the apartment, and then leaves. 
Now that's the way the tale was sold in the 1970s. The Diane Keaton movie, which is a must-see, even has roaches crawling in her apartment and stuff like that just to show you how Roseanne Quinn <clears throat> was living an immoral life and had reached a point in her life where it was all falling apart. Now this is how it was sold to us in 1975 in the book. It's now 2015. Let's look back at the cultural bias because the tale we've been sold is a total lie. Right? That tale even includes right John Wayne Wilson's claim that shortly before he kills Roseanne Quinn she begs him kill me please kill me please right that feeds into the idea that she hates herself she's disturbed that's why she is sexually active that's why she is promiscuous right <clears throat> now let me say this I'm not here suggesting that everyone who is sexually promiscuous um, you know is bulletproof and uh, is living you know the right life and uh, can never be guilty of any wrongdoing as longtime subscribers here online know I personally feel Amanda Knox committed the crime on which she was charged. That's my own personal belief, right? My own political view is really a libertarian one. It's live and let live. But let's get under the hood here on this Roseanne Quinn cautionary tale and point out how ridiculous the tale is. First, let's look at the victim herself. Understand that she is 28 years old. She's still a young woman. Right? She's in her prime. Um, but she's also an adult. She's not 17 years old. She makes her own decisions. Right? Here in America... You have the right to vote at 18. It's a little bit ridiculous to think that a woman in her late 20s should be told how she should live her sex life. Right? Those are her decisions to make. Frankly, in my opinion, it's really none of our business who she decides to sleep with. She's an adult woman. Right? She's an adult period. Let's go one step further. You know, she's a teacher. In fact, she's a teacher at a school for the deaf. She's actually going for an advanced degree. She's attending night school. She's paying her bills. She has an apartment in New York City. Right? She's a responsible adult. In my opinion, the idea that somehow she's a scarred individual. Somehow, you know, the fact that she had polio as a child is supposed to have made her depraved is ludicrous. That's just an effort to discredit people who have a disability or who've had a disability. Right? Go online and look up this case. You're going to hear that you know, she walked with a slight limp. What exactly is that supposed to imply? That the limp caused her to doubt herself and that because of some feeling of inadequacy she had to pick up strange men in bars? Why is the limp even relevant? Right? The idea, too, that she somehow is damaged and suffering from some deep mental injury is woven into the story with the claim from really the person who should be the least credible person in this whole thing the guy who killed her right his claim that she says kill me please kill me please 
right? Um, it's absurd. The only person with that version of events is the killer. And isn't that version of events a bit self-serving? So in my opinion here, you have a bias against a woman being in control of her own sex life, right? Who Roseanne Quinn slept with is her business. The fact that she's sexually active doesn't mean that she's the cause of her murder, right? It simply doesn't. Folks, too, are trying to buy into the idea that she caused her own death by, of course, mocking the killer, right? Complaining to the killer that he wasn't a man because he couldn't get it up for her, right? That's, that's the claim. We'll let this phone call come and go. Just understand that the killer's story is discredited by the physical evidence, right? The killer wants you to believe that he was a decent person. They would have had an easy interaction if this evil woman didn't mock him, didn't mock his inability to have sex that night. Right? Didn't tell him, hey, you came up here and you can't perform. What's going on? Didn't challenge his manhood. How could a woman challenge a guy's manhood? Right? Did you know that the police determined, looking at the body, that in fact there was semen on Roseanne Quinn? That, in fact, she had had sex with John Wayne Wilson. Right? Wilson wants you to believe that he was mocked for an inability to have an erection. The physical evidence shows that he had an erection. Right? The only story out there that says he didn't is from him. Right? He had an erection. If he had an erection, shouldn't we challenge the idea that she mocked him at all? What would she be mocking him over? Right? Think about it. Right? Let me, uh, let me also say, too, that part of this story is racist, isn't it? Right? Some neighbor told the police that Roseanne Quinn, who was white, actually had some paramours who were Negroes. The dreaded N-word from the 1970s. Right? Of course, we're hearing about this, and we're even hearing that, you know, neighbors heard shouting and yelling from Roseanne Quinn's apartment. Apparently, Roseanne Quinn, from time to time, every few weeks or so, would have a guy over at her apartment, and there'd be yelling. And um, sometimes she would actually be seen later with some bruises on her, right? There's even a guy, I believe his name's Freddie Watson, a black guy who frequented the bar across the street that Roseanne Quinn frequented, right? Who apparently saw Roseanne Quinn, you know, more than once. There's even, you know, the claim that the police questioned him and viewed him as a suspect, right? Isn't this obvious racism? Number one, Freddie Quinn, uh, excuse me, 
Mr. Watson wasn't even at the bar the night that Roseanne Quinn left with John Wayne Watson, right? Watson would later admit to the crime, right? But understand, Freddie shouldn't even have been a viable witness, right? Shouldn't have been a suspect. He had nothing to do with Roseanne Quinn's death, right? Also, why the spotlight? on black guys Roseanne Quinn dated, right? When she dated white guys as well. Why single out black guys at all, right? Keep in mind too that the neighbors felt that Roseanne Quinn was having consensual sex with her boyfriends, right? Today, we would say Roseanne Quinn might be into, let's say, pull my hair type sex, spank me type sex, right? Hit me, talk dirty to me type sex. She's a grown woman. Isn't that her right here in the United States? If rough sex is her thing and it's consensual, if she's into getting hit a little bit and stuff like that and role play with her partner, why exactly is that our business? But yet it was in the 1970s, right? Because in the 1970s, we were hearing about stuff like this and we were thinking, my goodness, you know, this woman was depraved. This woman caused her own death, right? Weren't gays also tarred? Wasn't a theme of the looking for Mr. Goodbar myth. The idea that, you know, this gay man shouldn't have been with this straight woman, right? Because, of course, his gayness caused him to not have an erection. Leading, of course, this evil woman to mock him. Right? Now we're finding out the guy had an erection. The guy's bisexuality really is irrelevant to the story. Right? The accusation makes for salacious reading in the 1970s. It's simply not supported by the physical evidence which shows that the guy left semen at the scene of the murder, right? It's just simply not supported. Let me point out too, there are other people involved. Roseanne Quinn had co-workers, right? The co-workers loved her. At work, apparently she was an excellent teacher Right? Roseanne Quinn, quite frankly, seems to have been good at her job. Many people at work couldn't believe that Roseanne Quinn even had a private sex life. Right? Well, in the United States, don't we have a right to privacy? Also, if she's a good teacher and she's keeping it together, right, then exactly what is the problem? Sounds like she's a productive member of society with her own sexual fetishes. What exactly is wrong with that? Right? And so, really, the Roseanne Quinn situation isn't a whodunit. Because John Wayne Wilson confessed. Believe it or not, while in custody, a few months later, he actually commits suicide. We know this individual was troubled, right? We know he was a murderer, right? But don't kid yourself. He had a police record before he met, he met Roseanne Quinn, right? The idea that this murder was caused because he was, you know, a closeted gay man who couldn't get it up is simply untrue. 
The idea that Roseanne Quinn got killed because she hung out with black guys from time to time is simply not true. Right? No black guy was involved in her murder. Right? Her former lover, of uh, Freddie Watson, wasn't even at the bar the night she was murdered. Right? The idea, too, that a woman at 28 and single has to be depraved if she's actually going to go to bars or clubs and meet men and hook up with them is so ridiculous from a 2015 perspective that it doesn't even warrant a serious response, right? It was salacious in the 1970s, right? Today we call that single life, right? So let's not get confused here. There's a clear victim. It's Roseanne Quinn. She got killed by someone who, in my opinion, gave the police a tall tale that didn't fit the physical evidence, right? And, of course, didn't do this killing impulsively because the guy had the presence of mind to wipe his prints from the scene. Understand, he only gets caught later when the guy he lived with notifies police, right? He doesn't get caught based on fingerprints they found at the scene. Rather, his friend turns him in, right? And so, really, you need to look at, you know, looking for Mr. Goodbar, almost like you would look at a piece of archaeology, right? It's just a work of art that shows you the cultural biases at the time, right? Interracial sex, sex with a bisexual, an unmarried woman on her own with her own career in Manhattan. God help us all. Right? That storyline in the 1970s led to a best-selling book and a high-grossing movie. Right? Today, we would see it for what it is. A vicious murder by a psychopath who then tried to cover his tracks and who then tried to defame the victim in statements to police that were discredited by the physical evidence. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Even the name of the book, Looking for Mr. Good Bar. Right? In the 70s, we thought, ooh, ooh, ooh. Right? Even the name of the book is saucy. Right? Implies a lot. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.